Welcome to today's Global Health Lecture. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Rick Johnson, Chief of uh, the Division of Renal Diseases and Hypertension here at the University of Colorado, and will be speaking with us about an epidemic of chronic kidney disease linked with heat stress and climate change. Dr. Johnson. Thanks. You all hear me? Is this good? All right. Well, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for coming to this lecture. I'm going to talk to you about a mysterious epidemic that has been uh, uh, has risen in Central America uh, in the last decade. And it's got the name Mesoamerican nephropathy because it's primarily seen in Central America. And CKD represent, is a mnemonic for a chronic kidney disease. So it's a chronic kidney disease. So this epidemic occurs primarily along the Pacific coast of Central America. Uh, it's present in Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica. And uh, it primarily affects men. And um, primarily men that are working in agricultural communities, per, uh, working manually outside, and, uh, and particularly in sugarcane communities. It also does affect some women, and some of the women are working in the, these fields, and there's now evidence that there may be children being affected who aren't working in these uh, fields at all. And so far there's been over 20,000 documented deaths, but that's just the documented cases, and we think that it's much, much greater than that. Whoop. Well, we know it's an epidemic. Uh, we've been able to go back and look at uh, historical records, uh, and we know that it's particularly common in certain districts uh, that are along the Pacific coast in particular, and one of them in uh, Costa Rica is Guanacaste. And in Guanacaste, we've been able to get data, mortality data related to uh, kidney disease and it looks like it really wasn't present in the early 1970s, or if it was, it was just slightly uh, higher than the rest of Costa Rica. But it has increased almost tenfold, five to tenfold since then. And we see it both in women and in men living in these areas. Uh, so we, we do believe it's a true epidemic that it's not just being better recognized, but it's also true that the communities where these, this disease is occurring tend to be places where, where the, the people are very poor, they often don't see doctors, uh, and if they do, they really, uh, they, you know, rarely, for example, kidney biopsies aren't performed there, there's no dialysis available, and often testing of these patients is quite limited, so it's possible that it pre, you know, that it was back there in the 1970s, but um, but we think that it is a true epidemic. The clinical manifestations are what you uh, commonly see with chronic kidney disease, with one major exception, and that is, you know, uh, in the rest of the world, the most common cause of kidney disease is diabetes. Yet this is not a disease associated with diabetes. The second most common is high blood pressure, hypertension, severe hypertension. But these subjects have normal blood pressure or only it's slightly elevated. A third cause is a disease called glomerulonephritis where you get a lot of protein in the urine and, uh, and it's the third most common cause in the rest of the world, but that's not present here either. And the fourth most common cause is polycystic kidney disease, a hereditary kidney disease, and that's not the cause of this either. So this is really what we call CKD, chronic kidney disease of an unknown etiology. And it's been a mystery, and groups from all over the world have gone there to try to figure it out, from the CDC and the World Health Organization to uh, scientific groups from England, Sweden, and from Colorado. Now, they, the subjects present with an asymptomatic rise in creatinine, and in fact, it's it's such a uh, you know it's, it's such an asymptomatic.
harvest. And if their creatinine is elevated, they are uh, not, not hired, uh, even though they may have worked in the sugar cane fields for the last 10 years. And they, uh, they have very little proteinuria. The blood pressure is normal. They often have a low potassium in their blood, which is kind of odd because potassium is retained in kidney failure. And they often have a high uric acid. And when they're biopsied in the few patients that have been, they have a disease called chronic tubulointerstitial disease, which is basically chronic scarring of the parenchyma of the kidney where the tubules kind of fibrose down and there's interstitial fibrosis and inflammation. Now, sugarcane workers are particularly <coughs> at risk for this disease. And in fact, there have been some studies that have shown that when they go into the sugarcane fields, and they work typically from like September or October to like March or April, during that period of time, their kidney function's falling. And if you measure their kidney function before and after the harvest, there's a significant fall in kidney function in these people compared to factory workers followed over the same period of time. And so for a little while, this disease was called sugarcane nephropathy when it was first described in 2002. So initially, with the observation that it was occurring in, in sugarcane uh, fields, the local physicians and the people, uh, the actual workers, were all worried it was due to a chemical, a pesticide, a toxin, an agrochemical you know, Roundup and all these things that they were putting on the fields. And it was an attractive hypothesis. And there's still uh, doctors that believe it may be the cause. But so far, all the studies have essentially been negative. There is an association of pesticides and agrochemicals just because a lot of these people are in the sugarcane fields. But what we've been learning is that this disease is not restricted to sugarcane workers. The disease occurs in occupations that do not use pesticides or agrochemicals. So we can see it in construction workers, miners, people working in the fishing industry, port workers, and uh, others that are working in the same region. Now, it could still be pesticides, I guess, that get into the drinking water and things like that. And we haven't completely ruled it out, but the association with pesticides is weak. And during the season, the people in the sugarcane fields that are applying the pesticides are actually protected compared to the people out in the sugarcane fields that are cutting the cane down with their machetes. This is shown here. This is a study from Boston showing that sugarcane cutters, not pesticide applicators, develop renal injury, as noted by this urinary biomarker called NGAL. So that's a biomarker, goes up with kidney damage. And if you look at before and the end of the harvest, it's the sugarcane cutters, not the pesticide applicators, that are getting renal injury. So this has led to the question of what could be causing this disease if it's not uh, pesticides? What else could be causing this mysterious epidemic that is killing, you know, more than a thousand people every year? So a lot of thinking has been that it's still an environmental toxin. And uh, some of them, are, of course, uh, could even be uh, drugs that they're taking. And uh, a lot of these people are out there in the sugarcane fields, and they're, they're working so hard, they get muscle aches and injury. And it's very, very common for them to take non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like endomethacin or Motrin, ibuprofen. And it's known that ibuprofen and non-steroidals decrease blood flow to the kidney and could theoretically make cause chronic kidney disease if taken chronically. And there's even a disease called analgesic abuse nephropathy that has been described. And, and so, uh, you know, initially people were thinking, well, maybe it's, it's not really the environment. It's what these medications they're taking. But 
when they did the epidemiologic studies looking for NSAID use, it's true, 10 to 15% of the <coughs> subjects are using it. But when they actually look at the relationship, it looks like it's a risk factor, but not a cause. In other words, it's not the primary cause, but if you're taking a lot of NSAIDs, that's not a good thing. And uh, that's true true rule for kidney disease in general. There's also thought about heavy metal poisoning. And uh, it's known that cadmium, for example, can cause chronic kidney disease. Cadmium uh, poisoning occurred in, in Japan uh, mm -hmm. early in the century, uh, last century. Uh, and the, it, it got into this one river uh, in northern Japan near Niigata, and I actually went there once to, and uh, there was a lot of people who developed kidney disease, and they also developed uh, a peculiar vitamin D resistant rickets where they, they were hobbling around with, with uh, osteomalacia and uh, bowed, bowed uh, bones and waddling around, these poor people. Uh, and it, it affected thousands. But, you know, that's not what this syndrome is. We're not seeing kidney disease with vitamin D resistant rickets. And when they've actually measured cadmium uh, in the water, it just hasn't really panned out. There's been a, occasionally where it's like borderline elevated, but most of the studies suggest that it's not cadmium or lead or, or arsenic. So the heavy metal story, which was uh, attractive, has kind of fallen to the side. There's also this really interesting herb called aristolochic acid. And, uh, it, well, that's, that's the, the chemical from the herbs. And there's a number of herbs that can have this, this chemical. And uh, years ago, there was an outbreak of chronic kidney disease with similar pathology that was discovered uh, in Belgium, and they found out that it was all these uh, people who were taking these herbs to lose weight, and they were going to a Chinese, these Chinese herbal shops, and uh, it turned out that they, that aristolochic acid was not meant to be in the Chinese herbs, but it looked, the plants that, that have it were very similar to the plants that they use for weight loss, and so that it, it was contaminated lots, and it was turned out to be a worldwide epidemic from Chinese herbs, and it's called Chinese herbs nephropathy. And then there was the discovery that there's a little area in the Balkans where there's an epidemic of chronic kidney disease, and it was due to the same plant that was uh, getting in the silos and so forth. So there is this thing called Balkan nephropathy or Chinese herb nephropathy. And so people thought that maybe this uh, could be the cause down there, but it came out negative, they've not been able to identify it. And then, uh, you know, there's some infections, and there's an infection you get from uh, rodents, they, from their urine, and the workers walking through the grasses can, can get exposed, and the, the bacteria literally will invade through the skin, and they infect the, the kidney, and they can cause acute kidney failure, and some evidence that they may cause chronic kidney disease, and, it can present with this thing called leptospirosis, and you get muscle aches, red eyes, and you know, I mean, it's possible. And some of them will actually cause liver failure and meningitis. But you know, um, it may be the cause of some of these cases, but this is a, a disease that's just spreading throughout these communities. And it's just not been linked with leptospirosis to any great detail. I know there's a paper coming out saying that this is not the cause. And uh, I mean, the communities, uh, there's, it can be so affected that, um, that the area is called the land of widows because there's so many men who have died. And it's just fairly sad because when the, when the father dies and the boys go in and work, then they get the disease when they're like 16 or 20. And, they're, and so it becomes this circle of death. All right. So... It turns out that there is a risk factor, and it's the most important risk factor, and it's been documented again and again, and that is that these people are working in extreme heat. They're working 
out in the fields and they're getting recurrently dehydrated. And so this turns out to be a very common scenario for the people who are developing these conditions, including the ones who are not uh, in the sugarcane fields. So if you're a miner or in the, working in the ports, it, it, you know, it's always someone who's working outside rather than in an air-conditioned environment. And it is hot down there. This is uh, near the equator, you know, and it's extremely hot. Uh, the temperatures go up during the day. Uh, and by 10 a.m., 9.30 in the morning, on average, the heat index, or the wet, what we call wet bulb temperature, which is measurement of both temperature and humidity, exceeds what's considered safe by the Occupational Safety Health Administration. I mean, by 9.30 in the morning. These guys, so what they do is they go out there, it's crack of dawn. They're out there at 5 in the morning working. But by 9.30, it's already getting really hot, but they'll keep working because a lot of them are being paid based on how much they produce. And so this is an incentive to stay out there. And so they're working till noon, 2 p.m., some of them, and they're working under extremely hot conditions. And, they're, and, you know, the, the situation is not great. They, they, they have water bottles, but because they're out there working, you know, they can run out of their water. There's no, no situation where they can easily get back to the water until there's a break called. There's no shade. A lot of times the cane is burned the night before. So when they go out there, the fields are still hot. So not only are they having the sun, but they're being exposed to a hot ground, hot heat from the burned cane. Now one of the interesting findings that was noted early on is that the disease is, is really associated with the coast. And if you are in a sugar cane plantation that's up on a higher altitude with the same chemicals, the same job, the same everything, your risk for chronic kidney disease is significantly less. Here, you look here. On the coast, the sugarcane communities you can see, and then at high altitude, like where the coffee plantations are and all that. The disease is much less common. It still occurs. So my friend Ramon, actually, i got to tell you about Ramon. I have, I have a good friend. He's coming out here in about a week. So he wants to go to a rock concert. And when he was... Uh, a resident uh, in 2002, he was working in a hotel, I mean, a hospital of Rosales, hospital of Rosales in San Salvador, and, and the whole wards were filled with patients with chronic kidney disease. And, 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 and they were, there were very few patients with heart disease. And he said, well, isn't this a reversal of what the rest of the world has? And the doctor said, yeah, yeah, no, but this is the way it is. No one had knew, no one thought about the fact that this could be abnormal. And they were producing just an idea, like uh, Denver Health, there's like maybe 60 to 80 people diagnosed with end-stage renal disease every year. They were diagnosing 60 cases every month, 10 times the, the higher than what you see at Denver Health. And so he, he was the one who reported this. But he's been out uh, doing studies and this was a study he did, uh, Ramon. And I find this interesting because when, he, it, when you follow the temperatures during the day, the ones in general, the high altitude, at high altitude, it gets very hot, but later, later in the day. So there's more heat exposure, and it's hotter at the lower altitudes. You know, there's this really interesting, I found a paper from the 1950s that talked about the Pima Indian and uh, the Apache and some of these other Indian groups, Navajo, that are all in the Southwest. And they talked about how they saw a lot more kidney disease in the low altitudes than in the high altitudes there. And the Pima were living in the low altitudes. 
and the Navajo were living at higher altitudes. And I found that very interesting. You can actually document, and this is a, another study from Ramon, and I'm an author, but you can document that during the day, even though they're drinking, they're drinking five to seven liters of water a day. But that's not enough. Their urine is still becoming very concentrated. The urine osmolarity is going up. Urine specific gravity is going up. Urine creatinine goes up. That's just a reflection of concentration of the urine. And when you concentrate the urine, you act, you know, when you get dehydrated, you activate the angiotensin system, the renin angiotensin system, and that makes you lose potassium in the urine and your serum potassium drops and it's consistent with what they see. So urine potassium goes up and the, you also acidify the urine. When you get uh, volume depleted, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system holds on to sodium and dumps potassium and, and hydrogen ions, and what happens is you become, the urine becomes acidic. So the urine pH starts to drop. And they get, so, yes? So, urine specific gravity, the average below 1.03 doesn't seem very high. No, 1.020 is very dehydrated. You're, you're, you're used to seeing uh, three decimal points. So normal is 1.010 would be considered isothenuric or isoosmolar. When you get up to 1020, which is 1.02, you're already dehydrated. If you get up to 1.03, it almost never seen. It's almost never seen, uh, except like with contrast or things like that that raise osmolarity. But you can rarely get it with severe dehydration. So this is 1020. 1 1.02 is 1020. And they get non-specific symptoms, but they would be consistent with dehydration: headache, dry mouth. Muscle cramps, dizziness, lightheadedness. We actually, there's always someone who's fainting out there, but uh, you know, it's not like everyone's fainting. <laughs> but uh, but there's there's symptoms that would be consistent with dehydration. So when I first heard about this disease, uh, it was like 2008 or so, seven. I, you know, I immediately I was thinking uh, about it being a dehydration disorder, and I was thinking about a pathway that we were had discovered that might lead to, to be a mechanism for causing dehydration <coughs> uh, associated chronic kidney disease. And so I'm going to tell you about some experiments that we did. Uh, around this time that were that kind of preceded my actual going down there. And I, I wrote a little grant to Danone, which is a water company. And I said, you know, I think that this, this disease down there could be a dehydration associated disease. And I got two grants, and one was a clinical grant, and one was a, a experimental grant. And, and, and the trouble with the clinical grant is it's very, very hard to, to do with IRBs to do to do uh, to, to run a, a study in another country, I, I, and so I actually gave the clinical grant to some of my <coughs> friends down in Costa Rica who could could run the study. Now, I'm learning that there's a very good IRB. That they're working. It's easier to do clinical research overseas, and I think many people in this room are doing it. But for me, it was daunting. All the IRB groups. So, it, the classic teaching is that dehydration does affect the kidneys, but it's a completely reversible condition. So what every kidney specialist and every internist has been told is that when you get, de get dehydrated, you're sweating, and the sweating, lose, you, lead, you lose salt, and you lose water, 
And typically, because sweat is hypotonic, you lose more water than salt. And this results in a pre-renal, we call it pre-renal because we think the kidney is not actually affected. Pre-renal dysfunction, the B1 and creatinine go up. These are kidney markers. The urine comes concentrated. It can look like kidney damage, but it's not. It's actually just that the, there's very little blood going to the kidney because your volume contracted and dehydrated and a little hypernatremic. And as soon as you get rehydrated, everything goes back to normal. So the theory was dehydration does not cause chronic kidney disease. So uh, I have a guy working in, my, in our group who's from Peru, uh, Carlos Roncal, and he, he said, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to create uh, a, you know, an, an environment of recurrent heat and dehydration. Now we're doing it even better. We've got little, because uh, there's an exert, but they're working very hard, so we have treadmills and stuff. But in the original experiments, what we did is we took rats or mice and we would expose them to heat for like 30 minutes. And then we would take them out of the heat and then let them recover and then put them back in the heat for another 30 minutes. We do it like seven or eight times during a day. And one group of them, we said, okay, you know, you guys, you can drink between the heat episodes. Okay, so every time they came out, there, there, there was water for it. And the other group, we said, you have to wait till the end of the day. And at the end of the day, you can have all the water you want. Interestingly, you know, the rats that, or the mice that had to wait till the end of the day, they got to drink, they drank the same total amount of water as the animals that drank in between the heat episodes. So at the end of the 24 hours, it was exactly the same. Exactly the same. But one group had the water hydration delayed. And we did this for five weeks. And at the end of the five weeks, Carlos sacrificed the mice, and he found that the ones that were dehydrated during the day and did not get water during the day had tubular damage. The tubules were dilated. There was a loss of brush border. There was these vacuoles. And there was fibrosis, this brown stain called collagen-3. And their kidney function was worse. Their creatinines were high. They had more fibrosis. And the ones that were hydrated during the day actually were protected. So this suggested to us two things. One, you can induce chronic kidney disease with recurrent heat and dehydration. And two, that the, uh, that the, kid, that the, uh, that it's, it's the timing of the hydration that may make the key difference. And it was based on this study that we conducted a clinical trial this last year where we gave the people camelbacks where there was water all the time. They could just drink it as they work. And I'll tell you about that in a bit. Is there, is there any difference in this between using some, some like oral rehydration and Pedialyte? Yes, and I will show you that. I will show you that. It's kind of scary because we've the World Health Organization packets actually make the disease worse. So I'll, I'll show you that in a little bit. So although this shows that dehydration can cause chronic kidney disease, it doesn't say how. So this is where work in my lab had given me an insight how it might work. So when you dehydrate, when you get dehydrated, you activate two major systems. Uh, and what, what happens is dehydration act, raises serum osmolarity, and that makes you thirsty. Okay? <coughs> and then, coincident with the thirst, you stimulate the production of vasopressin 
and an enzyme called aldose reductase. Now, vasopressin is well known uh, to go up when you get dehydrated because that's what causes the urine to concentrate so that you can hold on to water. So it's like a protective mechanism, right? And aldose reductase is also known to be involved in urinary concentration. If you're a renal physiologist, you would know this. You guys are not renal physiologists, but the aldose reductase is another enzyme system that is an enzyme system that produces sorbitol. And sorbitol is this, like a sugar that uh, builds up inside a cell and acts as an osmolite, and it helps pull water and it keeps the cells healthy and it allows for urinary concentration. This is what is known in all the renal physiology books, and it's thought to be good. However, work from Paris by a lady named Lise Bonker, and we've confirmed it, is that continuous elevations of vasopressin actually backfire. Although they help urinary concentration, there's a cost with it. And it causes oxidative stress, inflammation, and there's evidence that vasopressin actually can cause chronic kidney disease. And if you take, if you take mice that are dehydrated and give them higher doses of vasopressin, you can actually induce kidney damage. And if you take animals with chronic kidney disease and you suppress vasopressin, you can uh, improve the kidney disease. And actually, there's now this whole literature that drinking water might actually slow kidney disease. And there's a big clinical trial going on in Canada right now looking at this very issue. Could, could something as simple as drinking six glasses of water, what we, we thought was an old wives' tale, actually be good for the kidneys? We think it is. I'll, I'm going to present evidence to you that it probably is. Well, just like there's this vasopressin is a bad guy, Aldose reductase is not always good because in the renal medulla, it's fine. But in the renal cortex, there's another enzyme called sorbitol dehydrogenase that converts the sorbitol to fructose. Fructose, think of high fructose corn syrup. Think of table sugar. Fructose is a, is a component of table sugar. And there's a tremendous amount of work by our group and others that show that fructose can be toxic, not only cause metabolic syndrome and obesity and all these things, and it does so independent of calories, uh, which is what our group showed, but it also can cause kidney damage. So now you, you, what you see is that with acute dehydration, these guys go up, it's protective. But with recurrent dehydration, where these systems are revved way up, what we call overactivation, now, the deleterious aspects of these pathways manifest. Indeed, if you take a mouse or a rat and you give it high doses of fructose in the diet, you get, you get kidney damage and it's in the tubules. And you, over time you get interstitial fibrosis. It's sort of like that disease down there, except they're not eating this amount of sugar. But if you give glucose, so it doesn't. And uh, the mechanism for the injury uh, is work, again, from our group. But basically what happens is when fructose gets metabolized, there's an enzyme called fructokinase, which is present in the liver where it's driving fat, fatty liver. It's present in the brain where it's driving sugar t uh, taste and all that kind of stuff. But in the kidney, it's in the tubules. And when it phosphorylates fructose, it phosphorylates it so fast, it's like a runaway train, and ATP levels fall. It's the only nutrient that lowers energy before it makes it. And the energy levels fall dramatically. They can fall to 30% of normal ATP levels. And that's been shown in people drinking a soft drink by NMR of the liver. So it's, it's real. And when that happens, that that energy depletion in the tubule triggers a series of reactions that leads to inflammation and injury. Well, so the, one of our questions was, could dehydration be increasing fructose in the kidney? Could, could 
And this is not from the diet. This is what you're generating from this aldose reductase pathway. And so we studied mice and rats where we dehydrated them, and lo and behold, fructose levels go up in the kidney even though the animals are not exposed to dietary fructose. They're making the fructose. This is scary. By the way, that's how high glycemic carbs cause obesity. We had a paper in Nature a couple of years ago showing that high glycemic carbs get converted to fructose. So even though you don't think you're eating sugar, every time you eat some you know, tortillas and rice, you're giving yourself some fructose that's being produced in the body. So we, we had mice that don't metabolize fructose. And when we dehydrated them where they didn't get the water during the day, they were protected. They were protected. So we are pretty convinced that this is a central mechanism. And we, we're, we're, we've now discovered that this pathway actually controls vasopressin production. The vasopressin is downstream of this pathway. These mice don't produce vasopressin when we knock out fructokinase. So the, the way the brain secretes this very important hormone is actually driven through this pathway. So then we said to ourselves, this suggests basal-American nephropathy might be a fructose-dependent disease in which recurrent dehydration leads to fructose accumulation, oxidative stress, kidney damage. And vasopressin is playing a role in this. What we haven't, because we haven't published the paper, I show that as its own arrow, but it's actually coming out of the fructose pathway. So this raises the question, what about rehydration? Because a lot of, rehyd of hydration form drinks are, have sugar in them. You know? And if you go down there, you'll, you'll, you'll see them drinking juices where they add sugar, drinking soft drinks, and some of them are drinking what, what people are giving them, hydration packets with sugar in them. I was the Gatorade professor when I was the chief at Florida. Gatorade has some sugar in it. I'm I, I, sad to say because, you know, I, I, I love the Gatorade inventors and, um, and you know, it's, they're a good group, but there's sugar in Gatorade, but it's about 8% or 6%. And soft drinks are around 11%. All right. So then we said to ourselves, well, if this is a mechanism for damage, then perhaps soft drinks that contain fructose might augment the injury. And it does. In fact, we just resubmitted the paper today. Uh, but if you dehydrate rats, either with water restriction or, or heat, and you rehydrate with, with a soft drink, you make the kidney damage dramatically worse. Vasopressin levels go up higher. Uh, soft drinks are dehydrating. We knew that anyway, right? And it actually makes everything worse. And the sad part is, if you take the World Health Organization hydration packets, which have 8% sugar, we can show the same problem. I haven't tried the 6%, uh, you know, the Gatorade. Almost don't want to. So while these studies suggest a role for dehydration and kidney damage, there is possibly a more important mechanism that we stumbled on this last year. And it was uh, a really interesting series of discoveries. So the first thing is, it turns out that a lot of these people complain of burning urination, dysuria. A lot of them do. And then there were these studies from Boston's saying that, that this is actually higher in the subjects who are developing kidney disease. And there was the, also the local physicians who thought that this was a, ma a part of the manifestation of the syndrome. And when they do urine cultures, there's no infection they can identify. But a lot of them are passing sand, very, very fine sand almost like a stone. And at the same time, their urine is becoming acidic, very acidic, because they're concentrating their urine. And when you concentrate the urine and you 
acidify, there's a particular substance that can crystallize, and it's uric acid. And in one of the studies we were doing down there, we discovered that uric acid was a major, serum uric acid was a major risk factor, 35 to 1, if you had a high uric acid, compared to all these other risk factors. But the problem, confounding part, is uric acid can go up when the creatinine goes up. So it's, it's a little bit tricky, but it looks like a very profound uh, association. There's a paper in press right now from the Boston group showing that the uric acid is much higher than expected for the kidney function. So it made us think, could there be uric acid in it? And so... Uh, we had all these urines that had been sent up to us, and Carlos went into the, to the microscope room and palleted everything and started looking at the sediment, which is what a good kidney doctor would have done in the start. And, uh, and we, lo and behold, we found crystals. And, and so I, I, before I show you that, I, I just have to tell you, there is, it is known that uric acid crystals can cause kidney damage. And the classic disease is called tumor lysis syndrome in which a person has cancer, they get chemotherapy, it causes tumor cell death, there's this massive release of DNA and RNA, it goes to the liver, it's converted to uric acid, if uric acid goes up in the blood, and then it floods the urine and it crystallizes and they go into kidney failure. It's a form of acute kidney failure. But here we're th talking about low-grade urate crystallaria chronically, perhaps what we would call a chronic tumor lysis syndrome. So the idea here is that they're heat, they're under heat and exercise, they're damaging their muscles a little bit, there's release of DNA, there's an increase in uric acid in the serum and in the urine, and then uh, that might acidif an acidified urine might crystallize. And so we started looking at this, and lo and behold, we could show that even during the day while they're down there, their serum uric acid is increasing during the day. I mean, it's going up in everybody while they're working out there. Not only that, but the urine pH is falling. So they're acidifying the urine, they're concentrating, it's what we would call a perfect storm. And there, there they were, crystals. We found all these crystals in the urine, and urine uric acid was going way up, and if we, it didn't look like the urine uric acid was that high, but then when we alkalized the urine to, to dissolve the crystals, suddenly we could see the rise in urine uric acid. And we could find it, and you know what's interesting? Some of them had normal urine uric acids, like this guy. This is, and they don't really have much sediment. But this guy, his uric acid levels, shown in the yellow, are so high, he's got that big precipitate. This is a sugar cane worker before and after the, the, a work day, you know, at the end of the work day. And, it's, pretty, it's uh, pretty significant. I mean, that's what you see with tumor lysis. So that given that, okay, so we just published that paper, and it's creating quite a stir. And, uh, and I went down for the, uh, there was an international conference in Costa Rica in November, but currently this, this pathway is viewed as the most likely cause of the, of the disease at this moment. Whether or not it will be three months from now, I don't know. So after the, at the conference, a big question that came out is, well, if this is heat stress causing this disease, shouldn't we be seeing it other places in the world? Makes sense, right? Well, at this conference, or when I presented this at the national meeting, the first thing that happened is some guy asked me that. Uh, and I said, well, I think that it's probably present around the world, but just not really well, well studied yet. And uh, he said, I don't think so. So after the talk, all these doctors came up to me from all over the world, from the Sudan, from Egypt, from Thailand, from Ecuador. And they're all saying sort of the same thing, that they're seeing this. So it turns out, though, that although these guys were saying it, you know, it's one thing to say it, it's another thing to actually find evidence for. So uh, through the International Society, uh, we started uh, working with the, the society to find to, to look at different parts of the world. And uh, it turns out that there are quite a few places in the world where there's epidemics of this is occurring. 
Let me uh, let me show you why, uh, and and we and we and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. I got ahead of myself here because I just want to talk about climate change and how this could be playing a role in this epidemic. So we know that mean temperatures have only gone up about a degree. That's not a huge amount. It's it's significant. Believe me, it's significant. But, uh, but what's interesting is the na the climatologists will say that that although the mean temperature has gone up one degree, the extremes, the, the extreme heat events, what we call heat waves, have gone up by 75%. And, and a heat wave, there, there's an actual definition for it. It's like, I think it's like more than four degrees Celsius beyond the average. But they've had these heat waves. Uh, they had one in Andhra Pradesh that lasted 33 days. And these heat waves are, have dramatically increased. Uh, last summer, the heat index hit 165 degrees in Iran, world record. And now they're projecting that this is going to be happening in, in uh, Saudi Arabia in the next 20 years. You can't actually live out there for more than about four hours. Even drinking, you can't keep up. This is killing. This is killing people. It was another big heat wave in Karachi, 10,000 last summer in Pakistan. 10,000 people had heat stroke. More than 2,000 deaths. In Ecuador, excuse me, in El Salvador, temperatures are going up. Again, it's only 0.8 degrees. But the interest, so, so here, here's the catch. So if, but if you look where the, where the, where the epidemic's occurring, it's exactly where the hottest areas are. It's exactly. Not only that, we've, we've now done climate maps with working with guys up at NOAA and in, in, in Boulder. We've been able to link this with other epidemics, which I'll tell you about in a second. But this is, this is the coolest thing. So we got all these urines from these sugar cane workers, morning and at the end of the day. And, a, and in each batch, there was like 10 to 15% of them had these very high uric acid crystals, but about 75% didn't, which you know goes with you know hydration and how much a person's drinking and so forth. But there was one day when we only had nine subjects, so normally we had like 30 subjects, but on one day at the end of the harvest, we only had nine subjects. But every one of them had very high uric acid levels. I mean like sky high. So we were wondering what it was about that day. So I looked up the date, it was May 13th, 2013, and I Googled, and by God, May 14th was the hottest day 100 miles from there. Well, we don't know what the temperature was there, but about 100 miles away was the hottest day of that year, the day before. And so uh, there's the actual night, I'm sorry, it's only seven, seven urines. But I mean, there, there's levels of 200, 130, 160. I mean, this is, they're getting kidney damage that day. So we think that this is a disease in which exercise, heat, recurrent dehydration is causing low-grade muscle injury, release of rise in serum uric acid, lactic, genera lactic acid generation, urinary acidification, uh, pro and then there's this proximal tubular fructokinase pathway, fructose pathway, pathway that's also involved. And that's fed by soft drinks, too. And this leads to this disease. And this is what we currently believe is causing this, this disease. So as I told you, we now know other places where this epidemic is occurring, and they have almost the exact same manifestations. Chronic tubular interstitial disease, high uric acid, low serum potassium. Many of them have dysuria. Chronic uh, tubular interstitial nephritis on biopsy. And, you know, and, and it's really severe in India, Sri Lanka, terrible in Mexico in this one region, uh, in Thailand in a place called the Isan region. Uh, some of these, they haven't done the big prevalence studies yet. They only, uh, it's only kind of this, you know, they, you can see it from some databases, like, uh, but it's not really been studied super well. This is uh, Sri Lanka, it's in the northern province. And it's interesting, that correlates roughly with some of the hottest temperatures 
Not perfectly, but roughly. Well, if this is a mechanism for kidney damage, and actually, we, after we submitted a big paper where we looked at all these different regions with climate maps, uh, we found an old paper from 1970 showing in Batu miners that were, exposed, were associated with recurrent heat exposure that they were getting the same disease. Uh, it's pretty amazing. But anyway, uh, if this is a mechanism, it could be important everywhere in the world. Anywhere where there's people outside working in hot environments, not hydrating well. And I have a clinic here at the U, and I started seeing patients with chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology who are mountain climbers. I have eight of them now. And one, you know, some of them have histories of recurrently being hospitalized with dehydration. I don't know if they really have this disease, but I don't have any other uh, explanation. And now there's data that low water intake increases the risk for chronic kidney disease. Other drinks are neutral, actually. If you drink soft drinks, it's the reverse. The more soft drinks you drink, the greater the risk for kidney disease. But when it comes to water, the lower the intake, the higher the kidney disease. And there's also papers coming out from Japan showing that a low urine pH, which goes along with concentra urinary concentration dehydration, also predicts chronic kidney disease. So I'm going to end here by saying that heat stress associated chronic kidney disease may represent the first epidemic due to global warming or accelerated by global warming. If there's an epidemic of CKD occurring in Central America, the primary risk factor is recurrent dehydration. Recurrent dehydration and heat stress cause chronic kidney disease in animals. The injury may be a consequence of phasopressin, endogenous fructose, dietary fructose, and uric acuria. That means uric acid in the urine. These pathways may be involved in other types of acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease and global warming water shortage and increased intake of sugary beverages may have a role in why CKD is increasing in these regions. Thank you. These are my cohorts in crime. Uh, Carlos Roncal is the one who made these big discoveries. He's also my brother-in-law. Uh, Gabi Sanchez Lozada is the one who did the rehydration with soft drinks. Miguel Anaspa is the one who really identified the aldose reductase pathway as being making endogenous fructose in animals and humans. Ramon is the original person who discovered this epidemic or described it. Jason Glaser from the La Ila Foundation has been very active nationally and internationally and getting the word out. And he just uh, became a finalist for the Talberg Award for Global Health. And Tamara Milagros from our uh, lab, who's did a lot of these key studies. Uh, so I can take a few questions. Go ahead. Um, so a couple years ago, when I was actually living in El Salvador, I remember they sent some biopsies. Uh, and one of the interesting findings was that there was glomerular collapse. Right. Is uric acid was that would that be consistent with? Yeah. So so glomerular collapse is seen with dehydration. Ischemia, low blood flow to the kidney, causes glomerular collapse. Interestingly, in experimental animals, when you raise uric acid, you get tubular interstitial disease, and you get some secondary glomerular sclerosis. So it actually is consistent. And you also get microvascular disease. What we'd like to see is crystals in the kidney biopsies, but the bi uh, you have to use a special fixative alcohol fixation. And then if this is a transient thing, when they come in for a kidney biopsy, usually they're not working that morning, you know? So my guess is that, you know, it'll be hard to prove. Yes? Have you seen any familial um, or hereditary component to what's happening with it increases the there's a definite relationship between serum uric acid and the disease, and I know that the group in Boston is, is thinking heavily along the lines that, that, that there could be genetic polymorphisms in uric acid that could be important. A friend of mine who's in New Zealand has found that a polymorphism in uric transport that reduces urine uric acid 
increases or decreases the risk for chronic kidney disease in Pacific Islanders. So it may well be that that same polymorphism could be important here. It's not been looked at. We've put in a, we put in one of these transformation grants. So if we get it, we're going to be able to do some wonderful studies. We're going to have a climate change center here. We'll have a graduate student program uh, and a physician program and we'll have clinical research going on in several different countries. So if we're lucky enough to get one of those grants next week, uh, you know, and you're interested in this, please come and see me. So. Yes? Um, so this made me think of what about farm workers in the southern, southeastern U.S.? Yes, they so in our grant that we submitted, we're working with a group in Stanford and also with a gal downtown, an anthropologist named Sarah Horton, and she just wrote a book that's coming out in June that's called Why Are My Kidneys Dying in the Fields of Southern California, or Central Valley of California. And that's the title. <laughs> and uh, it's there, okay? We're, we're convinced it's there. The data was presented at the meeting in Costa Rica, and it's also probably present in Southern Colorado. And we're working with Kathy James. Kathy's not here, she, but uh, who's going to do a study down there? Um, I know you said these patients aren't diabetic, but Aldous reductase is a major gene involved in the pathway to yes. diabetic nephropathy. Yes. Um, and you know, especially for type one diabetes, yes. it's a definite genetic component. Yes. So I wonder, you know, what the overlap is. In yes. Of the pathway and. Yes. So, so aldose reductase is activated by hyperosmolarity, such as with uh, dehydration. It's also activated by high glucose and is activated in diabetes. Aldose reductase knockout only partially protected from kidney disease. But if you block fructose metabolism, the fructokinase, which is downstream, you protect that, uh, animals with diabetic nephropathy that came from our lab from Miguel, and also you block the effects of you know of glucose to cause fatty liver, both from high glycemic diets, but also from high glucose in the blood from diabetes. So it's a really exciting pathway. Uh, we're actually submitting a paper to Nature. I don't know if we'll get in there, but we can show that high salt diets can cause obesity in, in animals insulin resistance, diabetes, fatty liver, elevated blood pressure. It takes like four months, and, they, and you, you don't have to give them fructose, but they start producing fructose from their regular food. If you block fructose metabolism, they can eat all the salt they want. They don't get high blood pressure. They don't get fatty liver. They don't get diabetic. They don't get obese. Now, that's really kind of weird because do, does high salt diets predict obesity in humans? Well, Jody Stuckey at Stanford has shown that people with obesity have hyperosmolarity. And uh, there are now 10 studies that had a linked salt intake with the development of obesity, including longitudinal studies, the Monica studies, done in uh, Sweden and Norway. So I believe that the most common pathway to get fat is through sugar. I, I have written about it. I, it's the dominant pathway, but you can make sugar. And when you, you know, those salted pretzels you're eating when you're when you're drinking and so forth, the chips, they are. It's the salt that's activating the pathway that converts the regular carbs, glucose to fructose, and it's the fructose that's responsible for how you get fatty liver and diabetic and kidney disease. Yeah. So we prevent hemolysis. Right, that's right. So we're going to do a clinical trial in El Salvador if we get funded with a bicarbonate to alkalize the urine and with allopurinol to lower uric acid. And it's still this. Everything I tell you today remains a hypothesis until there's clinical trials. But we do have some data that improving hydration with water back. Uh, I mean, Camelback and better shade is, is, uh, is reducing the amount of kidney damage in the sugarcane workers. We do have some evidence for that this year, but uh, the allopurinol bicarb story needs to be proven. 
it needs to be done. Uh, and you know, we're we're working with hypotheses until it's uh, until we prove it one way or the other. Yes. That was part of my question whether there was any thought of looking at medications like nicotine oxidase inhibitors for preventing progression with other um, or Is there any higher incidence of gout in these patients if their acid is playing a major role? Well, so the, so so uh, we haven't really looked at gout itself. But um, these are often very young people. And I know that, you know, so we, we, our group did two studies where we linked the uric acid. But I know that Boston, because I just reviewed the paper, but Boston has a paper now in press showing that uric acid is very high in their cohorts that they were studying in, in Nicaragua. And it's much higher than expected for the kidney function. They compared it to NHANES. They, did, they really did a, a well done study. Uh, so, you know, I think it's, I think that the uric acid story looks strong for Central America. I've also received um, correspondence from the epidemic, related to the epidemic in India and in Thailand that they're seeing the high uric acids too. But then I just got one report saying that it may not be that high in one region of India. So, undecided. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>